So um, the tutorial is going to be in English mostly, but you can also I also speak French. So if you if you have questions, you can ask them. If you don't feel comfortable asking them in uh, in English, you can just ask them in French, and I will try to uh, reply in French as well. So I'm uh, I'm Sebastian. Let's see, I actually have a pointer. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mato, so I'm uh, the, the, the lead developer of Open Sesame. Uh, with us is Daniel Schrij, who is also uh, here visiting us, uh, visiting, visiting the lab, working on Open Sesame. And Open Sesame is a tool, as you know, because you signed up, to make experiments. So, uh, what we will do today, I'll start by giving a short introduction, which is just this, uh, this uh, presentation. Then we're going to make a simple experiment, which is the, 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 the tutorial that you have in front of you. It's going to be really basic, so I think everyone will be able, able to follow it, just to kind of get the general idea of how Open Sesame works and the logic behind, uh, behind the program. Uh, we will take a little bit of a coffee break, or not if we don't feel like it, but I probably will feel like it, that's 45 minutes. <laughs> and then we, 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 finish the, uh, we finish the tutorial, I estimate it will take about an hour and a half. If we finish early, uh, we can do some extra things. If we finish late, we just, we, when we're tired, we just stop. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me at any time, right? It's, if we have a bit of an interaction, it's better than if you just follow everything, everything that, I, uh, that I do. So, a little bit about Open Sesame. So, Open Sesame is, as I said, a graphical experiment builder, so it is a tool that psychologists and neuroscientists and experimental economists, basically all the researchers that do behavioral experiments, uh, can use to create experiments in kind of a simple point and click way. So it's drag and drop point and click. You can also use Python scripting in Open Sesame, and Python is a, is a programming language, quite a, a powerful and popular programming language. But we're not going to, to do that today. It's pretty, it goes a bit beyond the scope of this, uh, this tutorial. If we feel like we want to do some Python programming next week, then we can do a tutorial that, that has some Python programming. But we'll just see how, how you guys feel. Uh, open Sesame is open source, so that means that it's, it's free, right? You can just download it for free, you have downloaded it for free. And it also means that the source code of the program is available. So you can just uh, download the source code and change it if you, uh, if you want to do that. Um, it's cross-platform, so uh, I see a mix of MacBooks and Windows, maybe Linux PCs here. I use Linux, but it's also available for Windows and Mac OS, and uh, it should make no difference which platform you're using. So the idea is also that, like, say that you want to you develop your experiment on your own MacBook, and the, the lab has a Windows PC, then you can just take it from your MacBook, put it on the Windows PC. Always test, obviously, right, whether everything works as expected, but in principle that should just work. And there is runtime support for Android. So, and runtime support means that you can put Android, uh, you can put your experiment on your Android phone and run it, but you cannot build your experiment on your Android phone, right? There's no graphical user interface, only the part of the software that executes the experiment. But it's kind, of, it's kind of cool and works pretty well. So you can just really, if you have an Android phone or tablet, you can just uh, do experiments. And I've done, done quite a few. Uh, the focus is quite broad for Open Sesame. So I come from uh, visual psychophysics, but uh, the focus of Open Sesame is really all kinds of research within the behavioral sciences. And it's not even particularly good for visual psychophysics. I think it's really a broad software. So, well, I started psychophysics, like reaction time tasks, having complex stimuli like random, random dot grade, random dot uh, stimuli, that kind of thing. You can do that with, uh, with Open Sesame. Uh, but you can also use it for neuroimaging studies if you want. Like you can send parallel port triggers or serial <coughs> port triggers or whatever kind of triggers your trigger happy device requires. Social psychologists, well, they don't only do questionnaires, but I think questionnaires are very important for social psychology. So there is a form functionality in Open Sesame that allows you to embed questionnaires in your experiment. Uh, and for clinical applications, I think I, I'm not particular. I'm not sure whether Open Sesame is at the moment used much for clinical applications. I think it's used mostly 
for, for teaching and research, but in principle I think it could be used very, very well for test batteries, especially when you put your, like say you have your test battery, you put it on an Android tablet, and then of course you can use it very easily in a clinical setting. Um, yeah. So in terms of support, uh, which is of course very important, right? Whether you, if you can use the software, uh, if you use the software that you have some decent support in case you get stuck, because of course you always get stuck. So there's a documentation site, osdoc.coxi.nl, that has a lot of documentation. And actually this tutorial that we're going to do today is on the documentation site. It is just one of the, it is the French language tutorial on the documentation site. Um, there's a community around it, so we have a, a, a forum, a support forum, forum.coxi.nl, uh, which offers support for Open Sesame, but also several other uh, open source uh, packages, like uh, the most, most famous probably being JASP, uh, the open source kind of SPSS clone. I don't know, is anyone here familiar with JASP? It's pretty, well, pretty awesome, you should probably check it out. Through the forum. Uh, the, the, the forum has now well, I think the count is, is now up to 1800 something members, not all of which are real, part, part of those are spam accounts, but it's really quite a big forum with daily activity and people are very responsive. And we have a few people that actually act actively and semi-professionally maintain the forum to make sure that uh, questions are answered and stuff, one of, one of those being, uh, being here in the room. So in terms of outlook, so perspective on the future, uh, Right? If you're going to invest time in, in learning a piece of software, you want to know that it's going to, still going to be around in, in, well, in the foreseeable future. So is that going to be the case for Open Sesame? I, I certainly hope so. I think we have an active development team, right? Certainly, actually, in the last year or so, we got, we got a few grants that made it easier to, uh, to, to actively develop Open Sesame. Uh, so it's, I think it's going really quite well. And we, we, well, we have some... some Small funding, but still some, and some sponsors that help us really to, to keep the program project going. Uh, and we have, I think that's also very important, we have a pretty large user base. It's very difficult to estimate how large the user base is, because you can just download it for free, and, and then you don't know, right, with how much, much people use it and stuff. But at least if you look at, the, if you take the, 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 the visitors to the website as, a, as an indication, we have around 500,000 uh, hits per year corresponding to roughly 125,000 individual users, or insofar as we can tell individual users. Well, users, visitors, not all of which are users. Developers, well, meet the, meet the team. The core team consists of Daniel Schrei, who now works, uh, works actually full-time on Open Sesame. Uh, Lotje van der Linden, who works, he is, who is a PhD student here at, uh, at the university, in Ater position and who actually made this tutorial that we're gonna, gonna do today. Uh, Edwin Dalmeyer, who does kind of the eye tracking uh, stuff and works at the University of Oxford, PhD student. Edward, who uh, works at the VU University in Amsterdam and who does, uh, does uh, mainly, he does support, he answers questions on the forum. And so does Joshua, who is another PhD student here at the uh, University of uh, ex -Marseille. So those, and, 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 and there's me. So those are the, the that's the core those are the core people I think it's pretty loosely defined uh, some, I mean people come and go but those are the people I think that are actively involved in in Open Sesame and then there are many occasional com contributors who do things like uh, contribute to translation you will see if you have a French computer you will see that, it, that it's partly translated in French uh, not as well as it should be but it will be in the future. Uh, and who report bugs help us answer questions on the forum etc. Now, in terms of teaching, uh, Open Sesame is becoming more and more a, a teaching tool. It's also obviously it's primarily intended to be a research tool, but it's also used a lot in teaching. And I think the, what is very important is that Open Sesame has no licensing issues. Like for example, at the VU University Amsterdam, uh, where, where I did my PhD, they used to teach their programming courses using, using ePrime, which is pretty expensive to begin with. But also the, the students don't have an E-Prime license, so they have to go to the university, uh, and go to the, the computer rooms, which are always overcrowded, etc. And now when they, they, they use uh, Open Sesame, at least they, they, they're, still, they're still using Open Sesame? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 good. Um, and, and those licensing issues are gone, obviously. And there's no steep learning curve, right? There are plenty of good 
toolboxes for for uh, for making experiments, but you're not going to teach uh, bachelor students to work with psychophysics toolbox or something. Or you can, but it's quite tricky to, to do. So open sesame is kind of like easy. Um, so it's used for teaching at universities really across the across the world, uh, and for bachelor and master projects. Actually, a lot of I see on the forum now a lot of students which I think are doing their L3 uh, uh, stage thing here in, uh, at the university because uh, they're, they're, they have like names that kind of suggest <laughs> that's what they're doing. Um, and it's well, that's what I said. It's used as part of these courses on programming and research methods. So about using Open Sesame. Uh, an open sesame experiment is, is basically just a structure of what I call items. And an item is just an, like each of these, these, these icons that you see here in this overview area uh, is an item that, does, that handles one particular functionality. And you basically just click together these items to build your experiment. Like for example, you have the fixation and the, the, and the stimulus items that, do, that present the visual stimulus. The keyboard response item records a keyboard response. So you really see the, basically the logic of your experiment in this, this overview, right? This kind of tree-like structure. There's 10 core items that have the <coughs> most basic functionality, really things like you basically need in every experiment, like presenting visual stimuli and recording keyboard responses. And then there are many plugins that offer additional functionality, like that can, which can basically be anything. Like there is a set of plugins, the Pygaze plugins, who, who allow you to work with eye trackers. Now I use that myself a lot. That's developed primarily by Edwin, Edwin Dahlmeyer. There is a plugins for video playback that, that Daniel uh, mostly maintains. There are plugins for forms, the questionnaire functionality, basically, which are very important, uh, etc. There are a whole bunch of whole bunch of plugins that do various things. So that way. Uh, Open Sesame is really extensible, right? People can create their own plugins, and they sometimes do to a certain extent. Like, for example, someone created a very nice uh, set of plugins for, for mouse tracking. You know, can, I don't know if you know the mouse tracking paradigm, which you basically record mouse cursor trajectories as a measure of uh, cognitive things. Or then someone else uh, wrote a, a set of plugins for interactive experiments, which are really awesome. Those are these behavioral economics experiments like prisoner dilemma games where people really interact with each other on a, on, a, on, a, on a computer, on different computers that are connected, right? And those are pretty pretty complicated, pretty advanced plugins that you can use in Obsess. And the plugins provide graphical control, so it's not difficult for, from a user perspective, there's no real difference between using one of the core items and using the plugins. You still get a bunch of buttons that you can use. And new plugins can be written Easily, like easily, if you're if you're a programmer. Now, let's go in a little bit, uh, go a little bit into the, the distinction between the user interface, which is what you see and usually work with, and the <coughs> script that is that kind of defines your experiment in Open Sesame and lies below the user interface. And the, the way it works is kind of as follows: if you do something in the user interface, it generates a script. So let's say that your drawing is smiley. Then what Open Sesame does is this generate, generates a whole bunch of, uh, it generates a script that basically corresponds to that smiley. Like draw a circle, well it's a bit too dark maybe for you to see, but each of these lines is a draw command that creates this, uh, that, that creates that smiley. That happens automatically. This is a custom language, just to, 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 to avoid any confusion. What you're seeing here is not Python. Open Sesame does not generate Python script. It generates a very simple custom language that I call Open Sesame script. Uh, so it's not Python. You can edit this script directly, <coughs> and that's quite nice. And then you can continue using the GUI. So the script is so simple that Open Sesame can parse this script and translate it back into the graphical user interface. And that makes it possible to do very cool things. Like, for example, one, well, I guess you could say the design pattern, is to create a prototype display in the GUI and then make it variable using the script. So let's say, for example, that you have, usually in an experiment you have a, a trial that shows some, some stimulus display that is kind of the same on every trial, but not exactly, right? 
I mean, you, for example, you might have a smiley on every trial in the gaze skewing paradigm, but sometimes the smiley looks straight ahead, sometimes it looks to the left, and sometimes it looks to the right. Now, ideally, you don't want to create three different displays for that. You want to create one display that changes a little bit on every trial. And that's what I mean, but with creating a prototype display using the GUI and then add make it variable as follows. Say that you draw a smiley, you have, say you have a picture in your, that is called gaze underscore left of PNG and it has a smiley that looks to the left. Now, you create, a, this, you, you open the user interface and you draw, you draw that, that image and it looks to the left. Which is fine, but it only works for one trial, right? A trial where it looks to the left. Then what you can do, you take, you take the script that OpenSesame generates automatically and you replace the, the parts of the, the, the script that you want to make variable. So in this case, the, we, we assume that there, you also have a file that you have things that are called gaze underscore right dot png and gaze underscore neutral dot png, for example. And now what you do, you just replace the word left by gaze q between square brackets. And this means, what this tells open sesame, is that you have a variable in your experiment, which is called gaze underscore q. You see? And this, and basically the value of that variable should be inserted here, right? So if gaze q has the value right, it will show gaze right dot png. If it has the value neutral, it will show gaze neutral dot png. So it's kind of like scripting light, right? It's pretty easy. I wouldn't go so far as calling this programming, but you can, you can, you kind of, you can add a little bit of flexibility to to your uh, to your stimulus displays without needing to do anything fancy. Now, a little bit of technical background, backends. So, <coughs> if you have a program, right, there are always many different ways in which this program can control the display, collect, uh, collect keyboard input, etc. Meaning that there are just a lot of software libraries that basically do that same task. And each of these software libraries have their own advantages and disadvantages. Now, the nice thing about OpenSesame is that it is not tied to one particular uh, backend, not tied to one particular way of, for example, presenting stimuli on the display. Rather, there, are, there is a, 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 a box, selection box called backend that gives you a selection of various of these backends, various ways to control the display and collect input, etc. And each of these have kind of their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, this is what I said, right? And you can basically add backends and remove them more or less like plugins, right? So it's quite easy in OpenSesame to add a backend to, say, for example, you want to do something crazy, you want to present your stimuli on a printer or something. You could, in theory, could create a backend that shows stimuli by sending a print command to a, to a printer. That would work. It would not be particularly sensible, but perhaps but that would work. Now, as I said, every backend has its own benefits. Like, for example, one backend may be more temporally precise than another backend, right? So that you know with more, you have more fine grained information about when stimuli have been presented on the screen, which some researchers care a lot about. Some backends are more stable than others, right? I mean, sometimes it, will, it can happen that, like, on one particular operating system, you know, some backend just crashes all the time, which is annoying. Some backends offer extra functionality. For example, there is a library called PsychoPy that is quite widely used within the visual psychophysics community that has, that has all kinds of routines for presenting complex stimuli. Now, if you use the cycle backend in OpenSesame, you can also use that extra functionality that CyclePy gives you. And cross-platform support. Like, not all backends work really on all platforms. The best example of that is that there is a backend called Droid. If you want to present your, if you want to play or, or run your experiment on a tablet, on an Android tablet, you need to use the Droid backend. So here are the ones that we have. We have the experiment backend, which is pretty basic, but it has pretty good temporal precision. It's the, it's the, it's the default. Uh, we have the legacy backend, which used to be the default. Legacy means like uh, re remain, remainder from the past, essentially. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty nice, but it doesn't have excellent temporal precision. There's the cycle backend, which allows you to use CyclePy the functionality of CyclePy, and the Droid backend that you will only use essentially if you want to run your experiment on an Android device. Okay, now let's, uh, before we're going to do the actual tutorial, let's take a look at, uh, at what, the, what experiment we're going to make. So it's going to be a real experiment, but it's going to be pretty simple. It's going to be a categorical priming experiment, 
or in French, amorçage catégorie. So, participant, I just put the French word so that we know basically the, we are all familiar with what the corresponding English and French terms are. Participants first see a, a Q, uh, which is called an amorce in French, and a Q can be either the word animal or a string of axes, which is kind of like a neutral, neutral Q. And then they see a target, which is called a cible in French, and the target can either be an animal name, uh, like chien, chat, or lapin, or a non-word, to my best knowledge of French non-words, chien, chaud, and lapin. So it's a lexical decision task. Lapin is not, I don't think it's a non-word, because lapin. Lapin is a word? Actually, yes, I think so, because okay. there is a, a, a country called Laponie. Okay. And All right. Okay. People from there are... Uh, I'm called Lapon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, they won't be primed by the word animal. No, I hope. I'm not familiar with the country or the people, but let's just assume that they're not primed by the word animal. Um, so the task is a lexical decision task, right? All our, our favorite, uh, favorite tasks. Uh, so if you see a word, you press the word M. If you see a non-word, you press the word, you type the, sorry, if you see a word, you type M. If you see a non-word, then you type Q, which only makes sense if you have an assert keyboard, otherwise it's a bit awkward. But that's the task. And what we predict, obviously, the hypothesis is that a prime, an animal prime, reduces response times because all the words for words, right? Well, I should say, first of all, in a lexical decision task, we generally only re re analyze the response times to the words and not the non-words. So we will throw all the non-words away and then for the words, which are all animal names, we assume that participants respond a little bit faster if they're primed with the word animal compared to when they've been primed with this fake prime. Right? So that's, that's our hypothesis right there. So this is what the trial sequence is going to look like. We start with a fixation build for 500 milliseconds, then we present the cue, the most animal, uh, then an interval, then a target, and then the participant gives a response, and then we log all the files to a data, all the all the, the, the information to a data file. That's it. Pretty simple. So in terms of the design, I always think like I always think it's nice to kind of uh, uh, specify the design formally, right? In this case, it's pretty trivial because it's about as simple as it gets. But especially if you have a more complicated design, it can help you to really be to specify what you what you're working with. So. Uh, here in France, they have this, I think, quite kind of nice notation. If you learn, I think you also learn it in at the university, right? With this, uh, this, this thing. Does it look familiar to you? Well, I know they teach it now, anyway. The logic teaches this. But anyway, what it means is you have the S with the with the underscore line below it means you have an n number of subjects. The P two means that we have a, a, a factor called P, which is the the prime, has two levels, animal or the axis. Uh, and then, the, and then, uh, well, the C is a bit the, the cible, the target, also has two le levels because it's an animal, a word or a not word. And then the crosses means that it's a, a fully crossed design, right? It's not a boxed-in design or a, or a between-subject design. It's a fully crossed within-subject design. So, what kind of design is this? Well, I just said it. It's obviously within subjects. It's fully crossed. Well, I just also said that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't probably anticipate my slides more, it's, it's fully crossed, yes. How many factors with how many levels? Well, we have two factors with two levels. You could, it, you could also reasonably consider maybe subject a factor, but we generally don't, right? So in that, and if we don't consider subject to be a factor, then we, uh, we, talk, we have two factors with two levels. Okay, so let's start with the actual, uh, the actual tutorial. Without further ado, well, switch to open sesame okay so if you, uh, you if you just get uh, what's your name do, do you want to connect yourself to the to the power thing no no you're fine okay so I will take also one okay so what we're gonna do is basically we're going to walk step by step through this tutorial, uh, which will be quite easy, and it's also a good good moment for you to ask questions if you're like wondering, can I do also do this? Can I also do that? And you just ask me 
and we will uh, talk about it. So the first part, the introduction, is basically what I told you during the, during the presentation, so we don't really need to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to, stip to skip to step one, uh, démarrer, open César, start with Sydney. I think we will manage the first step. Has everyone started Open Sesame? Yes? Okay, good. So, if you see Open Sesame, shoot, I will take it. Well, no, I can use my mouse. So, if you start Open Sesame, you see a screen like this. So, in the beginning, in the middle, you have this, this general area, it's called the tab area, and that's where, you, where all the where, where all the, the, the important stuff will happen essentially, where all the controls you, of, the, of the items, etc. will appear. And right now what you're seeing is kind of a wizard that helps you to start a new experiment or to open a recently opened experiment, etc. Here on the left hand side, we have what is called the overview area. That shows, gives you a tree-like depiction of what the structure of your experiment. Uh, which is pretty simple now because we started with the default uh, template. <coughs> now at the top, we have a whole bunch of icons, that's just a toolbar uh, to, oh, to start a new experiment, etc. <coughs> a few ways to run your experiment, display icons here, a few, well, and a few other things which I won't go into. No. Have a seat. You're just in time, we just begin the actual tutorial. And then here you have the item toolbar, which will look a little bit, I mean, you will have slightly different item, items there probably, but. Basically, here you have all these building blocks of your experiment that you can like, you can just select and drag into your experiment to sort of add things, right? Say, uh, I want to collect the mouse response, you get the mouse icon, you drag it into the, right? And you have a new icon. That's kind of the flow that Open Sesame uses. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to start, I will switch back to this get started thing. We're going to start with the extended template, the second one. And that's kind of nice because the extended template already has a, has a pretty complicated uh, structure that corresponds to what most cognitive experiments, uh, the structure of most cognitive experiments, right? Because cognitive experiments tend to be quite stereotyped. So I double click on it. It asks me if I want to save my unsaved changes. I don't. And there we go. And you see that immediately the overview area becomes quite, uh, becomes quite full, right? Okay, now take your time. So what we have here is an experiment that starts with a practice loop. So it gives the participant a little bit of a practice uh, thing. Each practice loop consists of a practice block, right? So it's really hierarchical. We have a practice phase, which consists of multiple blocks. And each block in itself, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, let's, let's discuss it from the bottom up. It's easy. At the bottom, we have a trial, and the trial is just a sequence of something that is shown on the screen, followed by collecting a keyboard response, FC, followed by a log, something that records the data. Right? We're going to change that, of course, but that's the default trial when you use the extended template. Now, we want to execute the trial multiple times, right? Because we want to repeat trials, so the trial is in a block loop. And the block loop is a block, because a block is nothing but a bunch of trials, right? Repeated trials. So it's collapsed. Before each block, we reset the feedback. We do that because generally, if you want to give participants feedback on how well they are doing, uh, we want to do that for every block and not like a run in total for the entire experiment. So we reset the <coughs> feedback at the start of every block and then at the end of every block, we say to the participant, okay, you did so and so well. So we start by resetting the feedback, then we have to rerun a block of trials, and then we give the participant feedback. That whole sequence is part of the block sequence. Right? So, so the block sequence is resetting feedback, doing a block of trials, presenting feedback. We want to do that again multiple times, usually, which is why this whole block sequence is again in another loop, which is called here the practice loop. So there is a pretty deep hierarchy here. But it's also pretty simple, and it kind of corresponds course, conceptually, I think, to how we tend to think about uh, experiments. Now, let's see what uh, the first step is. I think we're going to, yes, 
we don't want to have a practice loop in our experiment. For some reason. <laughs> so we're going to select the practice loop. And then we're going to right click on it. And then we say delete or permanently delete all link points. Delete will do just one. Yep. Or supprimer if you have the French version. Okay? Now, if we don't have a practice phase, then this little end of practice message, message is also not very sensible, right? So we do the same thing, select it, and we say delete. Okay, there we are. So now we already basically have the kind of the structure that we want to have for our experiment, right? We have an, an experimental loop, which consists of a bunch of blocks, which start by resetting feedback, running a block of trials, and then giving feedback. Each block of trials consists of multiple trials, and then in the trials certain things, things happen, which we will specify later on. So that brings us to the end of step one. So, are you guys, uh, are you guys with us? Yeah? If you want to connect yourself to the power, you, uh, you've already done that, right? Good. So, in step two, uh, we're going to define our independent variables. So the independent variables are those variables that we want to vary ourselves, right? We have deep, well, this maybe insulting your, 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 your knowledge a little bit, but just to, to be clear about that, we have the dependent variables, the, the VD, the variable dependent, that you record, like response time, accuracy, but can also be physiological measures, etc. And you have your uh, independent variables, which are the things that you manipulate, generally the factors of your experiment. Um, so, we're going to define our, we're going to click on block loop, and that's where we're going to define our independent variables. Because if we define it at this level, every trial will have a different, well, let's, let's, first, let's first do it and then explain it. So, um, what are so what are the two main independent variables? Anyone? You know what the, the main independent variables are. So it's the prime and the q. It's the prime and the q. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we start by uh, we start by uh, clicking. We have a full vectorial design. I should say that again. And for, if you have a full vectorial design. There is the variable wizard, which generates this pretty quickly. So if you click on variable wizard, you get another table. And this table is, special, is specifically designed to create a full factorial design using the following logic. In the top row, you indicate the names of the things that you want to, the names of the variables that you want to create. So we will create, uh, uh, the, what's it, what are they called here? Okay. Well, let's just call them. Uh, let's let's start with just use the English words. Say Q and target. So, or, sorry, it's not a Q. I, I tend to right. call it a Q, but it's a prime. It's a prime. Uh, I'm a queuing guy. I do queuing experiments, but this is a prime experiment. So, and we have two primes, namely animal and x x x x x x. We have six targets, namely Shan, Sha, Lapin, Shun, Sho, and let's say Lapin, because Lapin apparently is an actual word. <laughs> and that's it. Now if I will click if I click on OK, what will happen is that Obsessimi will automatically create a full factorial design out of this uh, out of this uh, two by uh, two by six uh, two by six uh, full full factorial plan. Now this also kind of shows that you can think of your, your design. You can you, you can sort of kind of choose how you wanna how you wanna conceptualize your design, right? First during the during the presentation I said well this is a two by two design because we have two primes and we have two types of targets. Uh, which is true in a sense because the targets are either words or non-words. But if you really want to specify the details of your experiment, it suddenly becomes a two by six design, right? Because we, our targets actually essentially have, uh, uh, <coughs> we have three words, three non-words, so we have six targets. 
That's another way, of, equally valid way of, of specifying your design. Or you could say we have a two by two by three uh, design because we have two primes, two targets, and each target has by itself three exemplars. In which case it would become a non-fully cross two by two by three design. So each of these ways of specifying your design kind of has the has, has its own uh, has its own advantages. Uh, for specifying your design in the software, you are as precise as possible, usually. When you specify your design, when explaining the logic by your, behind your experiment to your colleagues, you tend to choose, choose like a more simpler way to describe your design. So I would say to my colleagues that this is actually a two-by-two two design. I, I have a quick question. Is there any importance of the order of the columns? Because in the tutorial you put it the other way around, so there does is it not. need to be this? Okay. No. So the order, order of the columns doesn't matter. Okay. Excuse me, sir. If I go correctly, you can specify um, different ways to your experiment. So in that respect, for me, it would be better to have like prime and target like uh, uh, word and on word, and then items with the six items. So you could do it. You could, right? yeah. You could, you could do that as well. Like, uh, but I think for our purpose, this, this, uh, for the purpose of running this experiment, this, this is fine. Yeah. But I just wanted to make the general point that there are different ways in which you can okay. specify in different ways in which you can think about the design of your experiment, either at a high level, like say only caring about the fact that you have words and non-words, or at a very detailed level, really caring about the fact that of how many words you have. You have. And the detailed level is what you need if you want to actually implement your experiment. Yeah, in, your, in, in, in the Excel files, if, for example, if I choose the higher level, so prime and you know, words, and mm -hmm. word, mm -hmm. then I have to specify also items, right? Yes, of course. Yes. I would create an extra column specifying if it's a non-word or word. Actually. That is perfectly sensible. Let's do that. Yeah. I don't know, is that actually in the, in no. the tutorial as well? I don't think because the, yeah, you're not doing analysis, but if you would, then you would. I think it would just be word target and non-word target, right? And then just is only the tree per column. So let's let's let's. I think I think Daniel is right. Like just to be just to make sure that we're we say okay, we get a variable called category. I think good name, and we say okay, this is a word. This is a word. This is a word. This is a non-word. So we can copy and paste too. Well, and then we select copy. This would be like creating this column is fine. It's mostly for logging though, right? It's not we're not really going to use that in the experiment itself. But if we're going to work with the data file afterwards, it might be nice to already have this code there. And then we're going to add yet another variable, which we are going to use in our experiment, namely the correct, sorry, the correct response. So I say add variable, correct response, en anglais, so with the S, not the réponse, but response. We say, OK. And then we indicate for every target what the correct uh, response is. And this was a, an M for the words and a Q for the non-words. So we're pretty redundant on huh? here. Because uh, we've specified that they are words and we specified also what the correct response are, is. So it's pretty redundant, but it's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Alright, that brings us to the end of Etap 2. Is everyone uh, with us? Yes, we're good? One more question. Mm -hmm. If I already have an, for example, Excel file with my table with all the words, can I import it? Or I really yes, it yes. you can. You can. Well, you can copy paste it from Excel into Open Sesame, uh, but it's, it's not as convenient as it should be, maybe. And in the next version of Open Sesame, there will actually be a pretty sweet way that you can just link it to an Excel file and it will read it directly from an Excel file. But like, for example, you can copy paste it in here, but you cannot copy paste the, 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 the column headers. So that's, bit, that's what not very convenient. And, and you have to make sure that the table is the correct size in advance, I think. So it's possible, but it's a bit of a hassle. Okay. I don't know why I came up with the 72 lines. So, um, what we're going to do now 
in step three is we're going to build our uh, trial sequence, which is generally the exciting part of your experiment. So, uh, so what our trial sequence is going to look like is, as I showed you before, right? Yep. It starts with a fixation dot. So that fixation dot, of course, will be in, in Open Sesame a sketch pad, because the sketch pad is the type of item that you use for visual stimulus presentation. It will be followed by the prime, which is uh, the word, which is uh, animal or the axis, followed by a blank interval, followed by the target word, and all those four things are sketch pads, because they're all visual stimuli. Followed by a response collection item, for which we're going to use the keyboard response item in Open Sesame, followed by a uh, saving the data file which is done by the logger item. So basically we can just take this graphical trial sequence, pretty much rotate it 90 degrees and stick it into Open Sesame. That's it. So we, we already, if I click on trial sequence, you see we already have one sketch pad, but we want to have four, so we just get one more sketch pad, we drag it into Open Sesame, below it, up, one, two, three. If, you, if it's kind of fidgety, if you, for example, you're working with a super high resolution display or whatever, and it's kind of annoying to drag it, there's also this, this plus icon that you can use to append new items. That's the same thing. Now, and then we're already, essentially we already have the structure, because we have four sketch pads, for our visual things, followed by a keyboard response to record a keyboard response, followed by a logger to write the data to file. So Open Sesame does not automatically write the data to a file. You have to explicitly tell Open Sesame to do so by inserting a logger item. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so even though it's pretty complete, what's what's com what is very 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 wrong with this trial sequence? Anyone? You guys got to interact a little bit. What's wrong with this trial sequence? What makes it ugly instead of instead of beautiful? Names. The names. Thank you, Daniel. The names. The names are really ugly, right? I mean, this is really asking if you have like, and I see a lot of people do that. They just never choose proper names. They just stick to default. It just turns your experiment into a mess. So always make sure that you choose proper names. So what we can do, we start by. The first one is a fixation dot, so you can just right click, say rename, and say fixation. The second one is the prime or the amos, we rename it to prime or amos, whatever you prefer. Then we have the interval, rename it, interval, and then we have the uh, Target item, and now it's now it's pretty instead of ugly. Now it actually makes sense, and it tells us what the trial sequence actually does, which is really important. Okay. One more thing that is kind of important to occasionally do is save the experiment. I haven't done it now so far, so I just save. I say okay. Well, tutorial. Okay. Just so that you have, you know, in case your computer crashes or you run out of battery power or whatever. Okay, that's it. So now we have created this this <coughs> trial sequence in the sense that the trial sequence has all the items that we that, that we need, but the items themselves don't do what they should do yet, right? We kind of created the skeleton, but we have to fill in the skeleton of this trial sequence. Um, so we're going to start by clicking on the fixation dot. Up, click on it, and it will open this thing here. And what you see here is really like Open Sesame really has a, a sort of a very simple paint-like uh, thing with, that you can use to paint your uh, paint your your visual stimuli, which is quite nice, I think. Like, say for example, you want to draw you want to draw a square. You just click on it. You say, okay, I want to draw a square. I want to fill it. I want to make it. Blue or no, purple, whatever. You know, so that's 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 pretty nice, I think. So, uh, but we don't really want to do that. So I select it, press delete. We just want to show this boring little fixation. 
Uh, so in principle, <coughs> the fixation dot is, is fine, but if you look here at the duration, you see that it's set to zero. <coughs> and that means that Open Sesame will present the fixation dot, but will move on immediately to the next item in the line, which is going to be the prime. And then the fixation dot will be immediately overwritten by the prime, which is not what we want, right? We want to show the fixation dot and then wait for 500 milliseconds. So we're going to change this thing to 500. But that's it. Other than that, this, this sketchpad is pretty fine. OK? Do you, then, have, do you have a function like that things will disappear when there is a response or something? Like that the well, if, duration is dependent on it. Yes. If, if, you, if you would want to do that, you would simply add a blank sketchpad after the keyboard response. Okay. So the keyboard response will block. Mm -hmm. uh, will block, will not do anything basically until you give a response or until a timeout occurs. If you then add a blank sketchpad after it, it will have the effect of blanking the display as soon as you get a keyboard response. If you want to do more kind of what, what, is, what, what people ask quite often is uh, doing things in parallel, kind of like combining presenting visual displays and collecting keyboard response, responses in a kind of complicated way. If you want to do that, but we're not going to go into this uh, for, into that for this tutorial, you need what is called the coroutines plugin that kind of like allows you to do things in separate tracks. But that becomes that we, by that that becomes quite more complicated quickly. But just removing something when you give keyboard response is just a blank. You know what? Let's do that. Let's let's actually get get the key get this one a new sketchpad and put it behind the keyboard response. We call it blank nothing on it. We say up, oh, zero duration because we don't want to hold up the experiment with this blank display. Now adding a blank display at the end of the trial can be convenient if the trial takes a little while to prepare. Like say what happens is the trial is run, then it prepares the next trial, but say that it takes for some reason because you have super complicated stimuli that this takes 500 milliseconds, which will be super long now, which is, let's say, then it can be nice to add a blank display to the end of the trial so that the trial ends immediately and you don't like see the end of the last thing in your trial sequence during the inter-trial interval, if that makes sense. So let's do it. Okay, let's move to the prime. So what we want to do in the prime is show the prime. Um, but the prime is not, is not really a direct text, right? You can select the text tool and you can say, okay, I want to type uh, animal. That will work, but it's not really what we want to do, right? Because we don't want to show animal on every trial. Uh, does anyone know how you do that? How you present like it, something that is defined by a variable? Can you find me put it between the square brackets? Exactly. And so you do in OpenSysm. So we select it. I select the tool. I double click on it. And instead of typing literally animal or typing literally xxxx, I type between square brackets prime. And then I say, okay. So what this means is not that Open Sesame is literally going to show on the display square bracket prime square bracket, but it's going to show whatever the value of the variable prime is, right? Okay, that's kind of nice. Um, and it has also a certain duration. Oh, the, the prime is only shown for 100 milliseconds. So instead of a duration of key press, which means like show this until you press a key, we change the duration to 100 for 100 milliseconds. And then I save the expression. All right, all right, all right. Are you all with me? Yes, you are. Huh? It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, but it's an actual experiment. It's an actual fully working experiment. Okay. Yes. And Lodja, obviously, she made in figure 12, she made a ni very, quite a nice depiction of what the logic behind this, uh, this kind of variable text is. Um, 
Yeah, so now we move on to the interval display. I, I have a really ridiculous question. How can you move it on the screen? Like when I click on it or dragging it, it opens each time the window for writing something? Yeah, so you see, so here on the left side you have different tools. If you want to edit or select an existing thing, you click the pointer tool and then you pick it up and you can, for example, move it like this. Or you can double click it to, to open the thing. If you have not, if you select something else, it will, like if you select, for example, the fixation dot, and I click, it will just draw a fixation dot on top. And you can also do a right click. Up, up. Sometimes it's a bit fidgety, I have to even, I have to. Up. Okay, you can also do a right click on it, and you have a few things, for example, raise to front, raise to bottom, and the yeah, ever important the things. All right, all right. Okay, so the interval. So what do we need to do for the interval? Okay. Just the duration, exactly. Just the duration, because it's blank and it should be blank. And uh, so, and we present the duration. So which should be a second here. So just as a sort of a more theoretical question, why shouldn't we present like a fixation dot here during this interval? Well, why should why I why why I think most people would say that's kind of a suboptimal thing to do. Come on, what would happen if we present like a fixation dot or any other kind of stimulus here in this interval? It would mask the prime. It would mask the prime exactly. It would mask the prime. We would get backward masking, so we don't want to do that, and we would get forward masking of the target as well. Um, Okay, yeah, so to the target. So what do we need to do for the target? The, tar the idea for the target is kind of similar to the, to the, to the, to the, to the primary. Really. So, um, so what do we need to do? This is the text box and we write in between brackets, target. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In between square brackets, target. Okay, are we done? No, no. Duration. Exactly. And this is where it becomes a little bit counterintuitive. So we have to change the duration, but we have to change the duration to zero, which does not mean necessarily that the target is only shown for zero milliseconds. What it means is that the target is shown, and then immediately, with the zero millisecond delay, Open Sesame moves on to the next item, which is a keyboard response. So it means like show it and start collecting keyboard response right away. That's what it means. All right, all right. Um, so I think duration says the standard it says duration keyboard. Mm -hmm. Key press. That's what, the default what duration. What would it do if you leave it like this? It would. Yeah, that's that's one of actually that's one of the. I suppose least count, least intuitive aspects of it because what it means is show it until you press a key. Yeah. If you then have a keyboard response after as well, it means show it until you press a key. Then the participant presses a key. The experiment moves on to the keyboard response and waits for another key press. Okay. So, but obviously people are inclined to sort of leave the target at duration key press because they reasonably think I want it to be shown until they press a key, which is true, but you can think of it like if you add key press in, this, in the duration box, the target sort of automatically becomes a, a sketchpad plus a keyboard response behind it. But because it's such so common that people, for example, want to show a whole bunch of instructions where you have to press this space bar every time after every instruction screen, you can add a, uh, a key press duration so that you don't have to do sketchpad, keyboard response, sketchpad. But bottom line, don't use a key press duration for actual response collection. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's not, this is not in the tutorial, I think. But I think it's nevertheless useful to take a look at the keyboard response item. So we have a few fields. We have the correct response. Here you can... If this is empty, it will use the correct underscore response variable 
that we defined ourselves. If you put between square brackets on the name of some other variable, it will use that. But usually it's kind of it's fine just to define your correct underscore response variable, which we did, right? Remember? In the block loop we have correct response here. Yep. This will be automatically used to define correct response because we don't specify anything else. The allowed responses is a semicolon separated list of all the responses that the participant is allowed to press, which are the M and the Q in this case. The participant can also press escape, in which case there is like a, the, you, you will get like an escape screen. That's always, always possible, you cannot disable that. But, the, but all, other, all other keys than M, Q and escape will be ignored now. And then we have the timeout. And the timeout right now is infinite, so the participant can take an infinite amount of time to press a key. I think usually it is a good idea to, to, to select a reasonable timeout. What do you think a reasonable timeout is? For a lexical decision task, come on, you. A second? Yeah. Sure. That's pretty. That's pretty harsh. A second. <laughs> okay. Two seconds. I would say like five. Okay. No, when I participated in your experiment. Then. <laughs> you did, though. Okay, you? I did. <laughs> now the flash pending key presses thing. Uh, what that means is that, like, say that the participant is during the whole, like, during the things are, that are presented, is pressing keys. The participant shouldn't, obviously, but maybe he or she does anyway. Then, if you have this box ticked, all those buttons that are kind of lingering in the computer are discarded, and the obsession will only respond to new key presses. That's usually what you want, right? Uh, okay. Then we have our blank display, which is just blank with a zero duration. Then we have our logger. Now, the logger is uh, by default, Open Sesame logs all variables. It, Open Sesame has a certain level of introspection. It can tell which variables have, have been defined, and it will log those. All of them. And it's a lot. I usually leave it, leave it like this because I don't really see any reason why you don't want to have a big data file. But say that you, are, you don't want that, you can say, okay, I disable it. And then, what you can do is kind of nice. You have this, uh, if you click here, you have the variable inspector. If I enable this, you see that it has a list. Well, my screen is a bit small to actually show all of it. But it has a list of all the variables that Open Sesame is aware of. What is the variable inspector? It, it is hidden behind this, this thing that is called show variable inspector. By the way, if you guys are starting it for the first time, there may be like a, a thing below called the debug window, which takes up a fair amount of the screen, and you're not using it. So you can use this ladybug icon to toggle it. So the debug window is actually an IPython interpreter. Which may, it may not get you excited depending on, depending on whether you have ever used IPython. Um, yeah, so and then you can say, for example, okay, I obviously want to log the response, right? Because Open Sesame automatically creates the keyboard response, automatic, automatically creates a variable called response. And uh, I say, okay, oh, I drag this in here. I also want to log the correctness. You want to log the conditions, etc., etc. So I'm just pointing this out for completeness. I personally think it is generally the more wise thing to do to just log all the But it's a matter of text. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, step four, I think. Right? Yes. Okay, what do you guys want to, like, it's, it's, uh, we still have 50 minutes, which is more than enough to finish this tutorial. We can we can take a take a small coffee break or we can just continue uh, keep going. What do you guys want to do? Take a break. Who says take a break? <laughs> then by default we all the other people. Uh, I guess it's a framing. If I ask the other way around, we're probably having a break now. Who doesn't want to? Okay. Yes.
implicit break. <laughs> well, there are way. Does anyone have like um, questions, more general questions about obsessing or things that you'd like to know for your own research? Yes, I would really like to know how to have, I mean, we were just talking about visuals in life, but how to define auditory ones and then have it simultaneously visual and auditory. Yes, well, there were two auditory auditory items. You have the, you have the sampler item, here this one, that, had, that plays back a sound file. And you have the synth item, that also plays back a sound file, but it generates the sound file itself. So it generates like a beep or a pulse or a white noise or whatever. With, like you have, a, it's a very basic sound synthesizer. Now, in playing it back, playing it back is simultaneously with showing things on the screen is really easy because you can say, okay, I want to have a zero millisecond duration, which means kind of like in the same same uh, same sense as the as the sketchpad, like start playing the sound and move on right away, and and the sound just keeps playing in the background, and then, for example, you can show a visual stimulus. So, that's and then for simple. duration, for the auditory stimuli, if, if my word, for example, is 400 milliseconds, mm -hmm. the duration is just starting after presentation for, no, like, I put duration. Well, the duration for the, for the that's maybe a bit counterintuitive, but the duration for the sampler and the synth means the time that the program basically waits. The time, so let's just drag in a, a synth into the experiment. So you have a duration here. Right now, the duration is set to sound, which means from like, okay, start playing and stay with this item until the, the sound has stopped playing. Play the entire sound and then just move on. If I would change this to zero millisecond, it would not mean that the, the, the thing is just shown played for zero milliseconds. It means it starts, starts playback and then moves on right away while the sound is playing in the background. Here for the synth, you have actually have a length parameter, which specifies the length of the actual sound, 100 milliseconds in this case. If you have a sampler, the length just depends on how long the sample is. So sound audio playback is quite easy. Okay, permanently delete. All right. So we are now at etap 5, step 5, the block sequence. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, so actually step 5 is more of an explanatory step than that it actually does anything. So if you click on the block sequence, what you see is that it starts by resetting feedback running a block of trials, and a block of trials is what we just defined, right, this block loop, so 12 trials, one with animal sham word M, one with two, etc. So we start by resetting feedback, running a block of trials, and then presenting feedback. If you then click on the, if you click on the reset feedback, it will just say, okay, you cannot really, you know, there's no settings, it just resets feedback. If you click on feedback, you will see this uh, this uh, this thing that really really looks like a sketchpad, but um, there is an important difference between the sketchpad, which is this thing, like the, the white icon here, and the feedback icon, the green one that's right next to it. They are both used for visual stimulus presentation, but they differ in the time at which the the the, the stimuli are prepared. And the logic is like this: say that you have a trial sequence like this one. Then what OpenSesame does to get the best possible timing is it first says to each of the items, prepare yourself, like prepare fixation. Da, da, da. And all these visual items, all these sketch pads, will prepare some kind of offline canvas, if that's what you think it will. Or some, they will prepare what they're going to show in advance. And then, once all the items are prepared, OpenSesame says, OK, now run. And then it goes run, 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 run. And also, and all the sketchpads, which have already prepared themselves, just need to like, kind of like show what they have prepared, and it goes really fast, so, that go, that, so it has very good time. The downside, what's the, yeah, well, let, let me, what's the downside of doing that? 
there are many downsides probably, but say that you want to give feedback. What's the downside of this strategy? No ideas? If you prepare everything in advance and you want to give feedback. It's not take into account the next response? Or exactly, exactly. So if you want to take into, for example, you want to show the response time to the participant, you can't because the, 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 the sketchpad was already prepared before the response was collected. So, and that's why there is this feedback item, which does exactly the same thing as the sketchpad, but it prepares itself only at the moment that it is shown, which means that it can be quite slow, usually not noticeably slow, but slower than you would like, but it can take into account uh, what happened just before. Which is why feedback is usually shown using this feedback item and not a sketchpad item. Now, you see that the feedback item has a little bit of text on it. It says your average response time was average underscore RT milliseconds. Average underscore RT is a variable that the Open Sesame automatically maintains that keeps the average response time up. Your accuracy was ACK percent. It's a, very, ACK is a variable that Open Sesame maintains with the accuracy in percent. Press any key to continue. So that's how we give feedback. Okay, that's how we give per block feedback. You can also give per trial feedback, right? But right now we're talking about giving feedback after every block of trials. So let's move on to step six. La séquence de session. Right, so the top level sequence, which is just called experiment by default. Okay, yes. Um, well, we don't really need to do that much. So we start, we have, well, we start actually with this about this template thing, which is just a notepad that has a little bit of information on it. Can go, delete. Then we start by have, presenting instructions. Uh, so I think instructions are a pretty important part of an experiment, right? It's actually, uh, uh, people often do give quite poor instructions, but I don't know, do you, are you, do you know John Duncan? He's a cognitive scientist. And well, anyway, he, he, did a, he did a few pretty cool studies by giving participants difficult tasks to do, and then changing, basically manipulating whether their instructions were given in a structured or non-structured way. They were always giving the same instructions, and they all, always kind of understood what they had to do in the task, but if they were not, if, like basically, if they were not giving the instructions in kind of like a bullet point kind of way, they just didn't follow the instructions, really, even though they could repeat the, what the instructions were. So I think that kind of shows that instructions are clear instructions, clear structured bullet point like instructions are very important part of the experiment. So, but uh, we're not going to spend too much time on that, so we're going to violate this, 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 uh, uh, this little pearl of wisdom right away. Set instructions, press M, right? M for words, what was it? I think, right? M for words and Q for non-words, or was it the other way around? Q for non-words, M for words, okay. Press M for words, press Q for non-words, press any key to begin. Okay, and now you see we just leave the duration of key press, meaning that this, this display will be on the screen until you, uh, until you press a key. Maybe like pick a nice font, say okay, serif, 32 pixels, whatever, you know, just to make it look nice. You can even use, if you want, you can even use a limited set of HTML tags. I don't know if you know what HTML tags are, but they're kind of a way to add some layout to your, to your text. So if you put a B followed by a slash B, it means that everything in between should be bold. See? That works. It's kind of nice. Okay. Uh, and the same for the end of experiment. The experiment is finished. Now, all that is not so difficult, all right? You can do that. Uh, you can do that yourself. What is more important is the experimental loop. So the experimental loop, right now, it 
it says here in the information, block sequence will be called 1 times 1 is 1 times in random order. Um, this is not usually what we want, right? We want to repeat the block of trials multiple times. So let's say that we want to repeat it two times, which is still not a lot, but mm, we'll do for now. Then we can do th two things. We can say either uh, set the cycles to two, in which case you will see that this, this table will become bigger and will have two lines. So I'll say no, 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 practice no, no. Actually this practice variable can go because we don't even have a practice phase. But if you have a practice phase, it's kind of useful to have a variable indicating whether a trial is part of the practice phase or not. Um, this is fine. Another way is to say, okay, we have actually only one cycle. Yes. And we're going to repeat it twice. It will have the same effect really in this case, right? The difference is more if you, add, if you say, okay, I have two different cycles and I, re I repeat them only once. You can change things in these, those cycles. If you say, well, I have only one cycle and I repeat it two times, then all cycles will be the same. So in our case, all cycles will be the same. We just repeat the same block of trials over and over again. So this is fine. Okay. Um, I think it would make sense to kind of do the same thing here for the block loop. You see here, for the block loop, we have 12 trials, which is not that much, I think, for one block of trials, right? But more sensible, what is a sensible length for a block of trials, I think? Short trials. 48. 48? I think it's a lot, but okay, 48. Um, now, then you can say, okay, 48 trials, and then you can copy-paste the whole thing. It's not very nice, right? It will work, but it's not very nice. So we just leave this at 12. Reduce, yes. And we say, okay, repeat each cycle four times. And then Open Sesame will say, okay, trial sequence will be called 12 times 4 is 48 times in random order, which is what we want. <coughs> so then we have 12 times 4 is 48 times 2 is 96 trials in our experiment. For the random, there's only random and sequential, right? Yeah. I also have it always with iterate. What if you want a super simple restriction like don't repeat the same item immediately? You need to put it in code? Yeah, in opposite, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll show you after. Well, I can give you like a little, little preview maybe. So if you go to OpenSesame 3.1, which is now in development, but it will, I think it will, we'll get, we're getting there. You see that the block loop is much more fancy to begin with. And it will have, it will support, uh, it supports constraints. So you can say, okay, constrain the maximum number of repetitions of this in this column, uh, constrain the minimum distance between recurring, uh, recurring things. And the way you do that is then you have to edit the script a little bit. But it will give you very nice, nice uh, fine grain, grain control of what you want to do. So you see, Open Sesame 3.1, which is what you're looking at right now, is, gen is in general quite a bit more fancy than Open Sesame 3.1. But they both, they, they are, everything that you will learn today will be equally applicable to three. Okay, back. Uh, but right now, doing a pseudo-randomization is kind of a pain. Okay, uh, yeah, that's it, right? We can test our experiment, basically. Set up, set, test data experience. Okay, so, so what we can do, to test our experiment, we have three <coughs> buttons here. We have the quick run button, the orange play button, which will run the experiment in a window without asking any questions. Uh, so it doesn't ask the participant number or the log file location, which is usually what you want to do when, when was there a question? No. Which is usually what you want to do because now I was just programming the whole thing without running it even once. Usually, of course, when you're programming your experiment, you're changing something, running, changing, running, etc. Then we have the, the running window, which runs the, the experiment in a window, but it does ask you for a participant number and a log file, so it's actually not particularly useful. And the run full screen, which is obviously what you want to do when you're actually running the experiment. So let's say uh, run full screen. Okay, subject number zero, it's fine. 
default location, you can press escape just to use a default thing, otherwise uh, you can select the log file. You see automatically it suggests a log file that's just subject number, subject, dash, and then the subject number, right? In this case, subject zero. If okay. you run the orange one, it will create a data file or not? Yeah, 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 it will create a data file called default log .tsv, I think. So, here we, here we are. Okay, presenting key to begin. Up. Sham. Uh, up. Shut. Yes, you see now it's so fast, timeout so fast, that's actually kind of tricky. Because even if I don't do anything, I will still like continue as though it is. So I think the one second timeout was a bit harsh. But it works, it works, the experiment works. So I press escape. It will ask me, the experiment has been paused, and you can press spacebar if you just want to continue, right? Or if the participant accidentally pressed spacebar, and Q, Q to really quit. Q, quit. Okay. Okay, so that's it. We have a fully working experiment. Um, but it's not perfect, right? It works, but it's not perfect. What what is like what 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 in your opinion is kind of missing still from this experiment? What would what would be like a nice cherry on top? Just kind of for the, for the user usability, like from the participants' perspective. If you just see how all these things go really quickly, what would be what would, what would be make the experiment nicer? No idea. Sorry. Slower, yeah, slower in a sense. I think it should definitely be slower, yeah. So let's say the keyboard response of timeout of three seconds, and it's already fine. But I think it's also, like in most experiments, it's pretty. It's a good idea to give a very subtle feedback on every trial, so that the participant kind of gets, gets some, you know, gets, just sees whether the response was correct or not. Not by playing like a sound, because sounds are kind of annoying. If you and if you only play, for example, a sound when the participant makes a mistake, then basically you're punishing the participant every time, right? Which is kind of annoying. It gives a very, very uh, makes participants tense. I think. What is better? What is better, in my opinion, is to just present a very brief green fixation dot if the participant responded correctly, and a very brief red fixation dot if the participant made a mistake. That way, you don't you don't mess up the flow of the experiment. It's very subtle. But nevertheless, the participant gets a little bit of extra feedback on every trial, which is, which, which, which is motivating, I think, it, it helps. So, let's do that. So what we're going to do is basically, after the keyboard response, we're going to add two sketch pads. One is already there, it's called blank. But we add another one. And we're going to uh, rename them, we rename the blank one to Red dot, for example, and rename the second one to green dot. You can also rename things, by the way, by clicking on the name here. So this this also causes a rename. Now, then, for example, what we want to do for with the green dot is just present the green dot for say 500 milliseconds. That's plenty. The participant will register that. It will be that's fine. 500 green. I select the fixation dot thing here, right? And then I click in the center, and it will be a green dot. For the red dot, we do the same thing. I select the fixation dot, duration 500 milliseconds, color red. You can also, by the way, I, here I just type red. You can select green things like this, or select colors like this. You, but you can also do more fancy things, like for example, indicating the luminance is just as a value. For example, 128 would be medium luminance. Or you can use uh, CSS style, 0%, 0%, that's correct, I think. Those are all valid ways to specify colors in Open Sesame. This would be 100% red, 0% green, 0% blue. Those are all standardized CSS3 color notations. But just the word red is by far the most obvious way to do it, obviously. So click red in the center. So now we have a keyboard response followed by a red dot and a green dot. So what's wrong with that? Condition. Sorry? Condition. You need a condition, right. You don't need to you, you don't want to show them both on every trial. You want to show them depending on the, the correctness of the response. 
of course. So what we can do, <coughs> click on trial sequence, and then you see that every item has a run if column, which is by default set to always, mm -hmm. which means that every item is always run. Now, most items should always be run, but the red dot shouldn't. The red dot, dot should only be run when the response was incorrect. So we select this, and we make use of the fact that Open Sesame automatically creates a variable which is called correct. Which has the value 0 if the response was not correct, and 1 if the response was correct. So this and correct between square brackets, because I can read it square. Yes, square so between square square indeed, brackets. indeed, between square brackets. Yeah. Okay. So it's 0, 1. 0 and 1. So it is correct between square brackets, space equals space 0. Now, the timeout would be incorrect. It would be a 0. If the participant, if a timeout occurs, it's kind of a special situation, in which case the response gets the value none, and, the, the, and it is considered incorrect. And for the green dot, it's of course the same. Well, not the same, but you say correct between square brackets underscore. Or it's correct between square brackets space equals space one. Okay, uh, so that's it. That's how you kind of define. And these conditional statements, these run if statements, are very simple, but a pretty powerful way to sort of control the flow of your experiment depending on, uh, depending on which one. Excuse me, sir. Just a question. Is um, the software like. Uh, sensitive to space or things like that, uh, for example, between the equal and the um, no, no, variable no. and the equal? No. Okay. I don't think so, actually. And also Is, does it matter if you don't put the space between the equal? I don't think so. No, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> No. And you can even well, well if if you use space in your variable, then that's not possible. But you get a warning, right? If you use a space in the variable, yeah, in a variable name. No, that's not possible. No, no. variable names cannot have space. No. no, 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 no. Variable names can only ha can only consist of, of letters, un and underscores. Um, but in these conditional statements, I don't think they're space sensitive. Like, mm -hmm. but uh, I have to actually look it up. And you can even, if you want, well, we get, get to that. If you start a conditional statement with an equal sign, then you can have it followed by actual Python code to do more complex evaluations. Mm -hmm. so that's what you want to do. This is like a very basic thing that just allows you to do a few simple comparisons, but you can do can have quite complex evaluations. Anyway, uh, yes, that's it. That works. Pretty sure that works. Okay. Yeah. Now, then we have now. I think that now the experiment is pretty, pretty. It's pretty good. It's a good experiment. Uh, but we can make it a little bit more fancy to illustrate another aspect of Open Sesame, namely, as it says in uh, step nine, we can vary an independent variable between blocks. Now, and the the example that's given here. Let's say that you. Uh, Right now, we always have an interval of 1,000 milliseconds. Now, you can imagine that a priming is pretty fast, and it only works if the prime is just is presented immediately before the target, but not if, it, if, it's, if, if, it, if it's presented more than a second before the target. So what we could do is we could experimentally manipulate the interval between the target and the, and the, and the prime. Um, so, we could do that within a block, in which case we would click <coughs> on the block loop and then we would extend this block loop with another variable, for example the example that's given here is 1000 milliseconds and 3000 milliseconds. So we would, uh, we would basically copy this, we get 24 trials, then add an SOA variable or whatever we want to call it, interval variable, with first 1000 and then 3000. But Oftentimes, you also want to vary things between blocks, right? So you want to have one complete... So if you vary it within block, it would mean that from one trial to another, the interval can change, and usually it does change. If you vary things between block, it means between blocks, it means that you first run one entire block of trials with one interval, and then an entire block of trials with another interval. And doing things between blocks and within blocks 
you know, they have their own advantages and some people prefer one thing over the other. I tend to personally vary most things between, within blocks, but uh, other people tend to vary things between blocks. Um, so what we can do is basically we go to the experimental loop and then we say we add a variable and we call it, for example, interval. Then we set cycles to two. Practice still no one. Thousand oh, and three thousand. So, and what we have now is that, right? Block sequence will first will call will be called one time with interval of thousand and one time with an interval of three thousand. Actually, it will be called two times because the repeat is still on two. Right? So we now have. To Block sequence is called two, two cycles, times two, two repeat, is four times in random order. That's what's going to happen now. Now, so we have defined our variable interval, but it's of course not automatically uh, used in some kind of a magical way. So how can we use the variable interval to specify the interval? It's really easy. You put interval between square brackets. You put interval between square brackets, where? Instead of the thousand square Exactly, exactly. So we click on the interval item and we replace interval by, we replace the thousand by interval between square brackets. That's it, that's it. All right. Uh, I think we've gone really quickly. Yes, we've gone, we've gone pretty quickly, so the, we have our experiment is entirely finished. So we can give it a quick test run, oh, run full screen. Now you know what, I'll, what I will show you, which is quite nice. So if I show the, the variable inspector here, it has uh, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, variables in it. Now say that I, for example, click on response time. It will show the response time. And then I run the experiment. You will see that it will actually show, the, the, you, it will keep track of the response time uh, as I do the experiment. And this can be quite convenient, for example, for debugging. Because you can also, in the same way, keep track of what condition your trial is in, etc. So if I start, I say sham, okay, M, oh no, wait, this Q1. Sham Q, correct. You see how the things change? Sham Q, oh. show Q, all the wrong words. Sham M, but then make a mistake. Show M, right? Mm -hmm. So that's quite nice, right? So you see that the thing kind of updates as the experiment goes along, which is, uh, which can be very useful. Okay, especially for example when you. Say that you want to look at the category, you can say, okay, I look at while the experiment is running, I keep track of the category and I see kind of I, I kind of verify whether the category actually corresponds to what I see happening during my experiment. You have a question? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but our, our little experiment works. So, uh, what do you guys say? Shall we, because we, we're kind of ahead of time, we uh, went really quickly, we can sort of take a, maybe take a, there's an extra section to the tutorial in which we're going to do the same experiment, but we're going to use pictures instead of words. Just so that you, uh, do you guys want to do that? Yeah? Um, to save the experiment scripts, like, shall we have to, I mean, how do, I mean, we save the scripts like in a normal, is there any to save the, the, the experimental yeah. script, yeah. well, it, the experimental script is, is and a, the is responses also. It's the responses are automatically stopped where. So you don't, is, So you mean the data file actually, yeah, not both. the experimental well, script. Well, both actually. Both. Yeah, the data file is if you have this item, the logger item, mm -hmm. it will automatically log all the variables in your experiment especially if you have this one, mm -hmm. this option indicated, log all the variables in your experiment to a data file. Mm -hmm. 
And the format of the data file is a comma separated values data file, or .csv, which is just which you can open in pretty much every uh, every text editor. Okay. So I will I will show you an example. So say here we have some. This is actually an experiment that I collected on a tablet. So here you have a whole bunch of subject one.csv, etc. If I look at those in a in a text editor, you will see that they right they are comma separated values. So everything is quoted, then there's a comma, then there's the next value, etc. Uh, but you, if you just open this in a program like LibreOffice, you will just get a nice spreadsheet. You see? And it will show you uh, all the variables uh, on each on each column, and every row is one trial usually. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the most basic. Basic. In principle, you can customize your data files. You can log things in different ways. But I think this is usually the most the easiest way to do it. All right. Okay. So to work with pictures, we obviously need pictures. You can download some, but are you connected to the internet? We're all connected? Good. Okay. If you're all connected, then what we're gonna do? I'm actually not connected. So I cannot really show you very well. If you go to osdoc.coxi.nl, so the, the documentation site, and you then click on tutorials, and I'll, I'll start there. You will see the amortage category thing that we're doing now. So you will see the tutorial that I've printed out for you. Go there. Oh. Doc. So if I click on tutorials here, and then on a massage category, oh, we just see this tutorial that I printed out. Uh, then if I click on extra, you see that there are, oh, uh, my connection is a bit slow. Up, 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 up. You will see that you can download these. Uh, you have these down. You have these pictures here that you can just download. So I'll just save. Save link as. I'll save them. Okay. Save them here. Save. You can use any kind of picture that you want, right? But these pictures are kind of in the theme of our experiment. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to do, this is a bit of a funky experiment. It's more to illustrate the point of using pictures than I think it's really a good experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to prime. We're going to use a prime uh, that is a, an, again, a uh, Yes, we're going to use, you're going to prime the participants by showing either a, uh, a picture of an, of an animal or an, a, a, so this would be the picture of the animal prime and this would be like the non-animal, this would be like the, the, the picture equivalent of the axis. And then the participant has to make a cat-dog decision and the cat being this the dog being this, <coughs> right? So basically, uh, we prime, and then of course, what we predict is that if if we prime the participant with a little canary, the cat-dog decision is faster because we've primed the concept of animals, I'd say, compared to when we've primed the participant with a with a accordion. Uh, what's, that? what's that? What's the English word name for this actually? Accordion. Yeah. Accordion. Accordion. All right, so that's the basic logic. So the first step, and that's kind of what it, what it, why this teaches us something new, is to work with the file pool. And the file pool is hidden behind this, this folder icon here. If I click on it, you will see that we have a empty thing. 
Uh, and this empty thing is just a collection of all the files that are associated with our experiment, which, the, which currently there are no, no files associated with our experiment. But if I go to this, this to my, my file thing, and this works the same if you, if you use Finder in what Finder is called on the Mac, I think, right? Or if you use Explorer on Windows, it works the same way. You just select the things, the pictures that you want to have, which are these four for me, and you, I drag them in here to, up to the file pool. Oh, this is okay, this harmless one. Okay, then I have four uh, files in my file pool. Then, uh, I can go to, I go to the block loop, and the prime, <laughs> is now no longer the string animal or the string xxx, but it is either an accordion or an oiseau, a bird, right? So I changed the prime here to, well, the animal equivalent is oiseau, select, or an accordion. And you don't need to, to put the dot png behind it. I'm going to assume that you don't put the dot .png behind it. The target is still going to be the same because we still have a chien and an, oh wait, we have a chien and a chat, but we don't have a lapin and a, so, and we, don't, we only have a chien and a chat. Okay, so we're going to adjust, just follow me, we're going to adjust this table so that uh, Yes. Okay. So we only have a oiseau and an accordion prime and a chien and a chat. Category is no longer relevant because we they're both they're both animals, so I say remove I say remove variable here. And I remove the category. Because the dog and the cat is the category that we're interested in. And then the response rule is that the M is for a dog and a Q is for the cat. So this is the table that we want to end up with. With a prime, which is oiseau or accordion, spelled just like our pictures, picture names, right? Just the name. And the target is shan, uh, shan or sha. And the correct response is M for the shan and Q for the sha. Okay, you just have to try Okay, okie dokie. Are we good? Are we working on that? Okay, so what we need to modify now is first of all, of course, the prime. So I click on the prime thing. Let's hide the file pool on because it takes a bit of space. And the prime is now, now, now a string of letters. When does drag and drop not work to the file pool? It doesn't? No. Well, then you use the plus icon. Yeah, it's the other option. It's so if, if for some reason drag and drop doesn't work, you can click on the plus icon here to add files but through sort of a file browser or a dialog. But usually you should be able to drag and drop things in the file pool as I just did. Okay. So what we've done now is we've added these four pictures to the file pool. Here's that. We have changed our block loop so that it is good for our new experiment. And now we're going to change the prime. If I click on prime, prime is currently just the, right? If I would leave it like that, it would just show accordion or oiseau, which is not what we want. So I select it and press delete or right click, sorry, and press delete. Oh. And instead we're going to use a picture. Now, the image element is this one, kind of the landscape the icon. I click on it, then I click on the center of the screen, and then I will get like a, a file pool selection dialog. And now we're going to use that trick that I showed you during the introduction of starting with a uh, this, the prototype display and then making it variable. So for the prototype display, like one, one prototype display would be using the accordion select. So this would be a prototype because it would uh, the accordion is one of the you know one of the primes that there is one of the two primes. But 
we don't always want to show the want to show the the accordion. Sometimes we want to show the oiseau, the bird. So what we're going to do is I'm clicking on this thing here. Select view, and there. Here you see that you can view your item in three different ways. You can view the controls, which is what you usually do, and you only see graphical things. You can view the script, in which case you'll see the, the script behind it. Or you can see a little bit of both, which can be kind of convenient. So if I do that, you see that on the top I will see just have the same controls I had below. And at the bottom I will see the script that corresponds to this. I will zoom in so you guys can see it. You see the script that corresponds to this, uh, this display. And what it does, it just has a duration of 100. It has a description, display stimuli. And it has this draw command. Now, how can we change this? This draw command here, draw image center is one, etc., etc., from always statically presenting the accordion to sometimes presenting the accordion and sometimes presenting the bird, the oiseau. Any ideas? We have to change file. We have to change the file, exactly. And how? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I suppose you have the image between the brackets. Exactly. So what exactly would it look like? Do you know? No. So, uh, for example, just as if I start with this, like prime, is this going to work? No. Yeah. No, because the, the prime, we, we, the way we specified the prime, it's either the string accordion or the string yeah. oiseau, but the files are actually called oiseau.png or accordion.png. So what should we, so the .png is missing and it won't work. So how should we change this? Just, so we just add the dot. You just add the .png we only did. Exactly. Okay. So file is prime.png. It will, it will change the prime thing by the value of our prime variable and the .png will just take .png. So this will work. Okay, so once you've done that, you say apply and close. And then we're happy. You see that Open Sesame gives you this little warning. Image name prime.png is unknown or variably defined using fallback image. That's just because Open Sesame doesn't know how to present this, right? It doesn't really have any meaning until you actually start running the experiment. But that's fine, right? It's not an error message. It is just letting us know, okay, something variable is going on here. I don't know how to represent this. can hide this. Okay, now. And then we're going to do the same thing for the target. So, we start just by doing the same thing. We select the target, which is currently a string, which we don't want, so we're going to remove it, delete. Then we select again the image element thing. We click it, okay, we click on the center. And by the way, you will always see here at the top. Top, well, I cannot point at it and show you at the same time, but like here, you see the coordinates corresponding to where your thing is, right? So you will see that, like, whoop, and zero, 0, is the center. And, it, and you don't have to be perfectly exact because it has like this grid, so if you go up, it will either jump up by 32 pixels or stay in the center. I'm going to draw, draw a prototype. Well, I'm more of a cat person, so my prototype is a cat. There's the cat. Now, then we're going to take a look at the script again. So I say select view, split view. Okay. So, and how do we change? Right, let's zoom in so you guys can see it. So, how we're going to change this is just the same as before. Huh? So, this is an easy one. Sorry? No? No ideas? We're going to have brackets and we write target instead of sha. Yeah, exactly. PNG. Exactly. So, like this. All right? That's what you had in mind. Yeah. Okay. And you see again this, this kind of this message telling you that our variables are used, but that's fine because that's that's actually what we did. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Now, if we're going to run this experiment, well, we have to change the instruction, of course. So the M word, I think. Oh, M were dogs and Q were cats. 
dogs, Q for cats. Okay, let's run it. Up. M for dogs, Q for cats. There you go. Prime by it. Up. Interval, dog, S. Correct. Prime by it. Cat. Oh. Okay, now this works. It's pretty trivial, huh? Works. There, is there something that strikes you as kind of suboptimal about this experiment? Okay, there are many things. Well, that's too vague. There are many things that are pretty suboptimal, but focusing on focusing on the, the look, <laughs> on how the pictures are presented. The background? Exactly. The background is kind of ugly, huh? because the pictures have a white background, and Obsessomy uses a black background by default. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is click on the what is called the general tab, which is just what you see if you click on the top level thing in the overview item, overview area, and we say background is white, <coughs> foreground is black. That works, but all the things that you made white to begin with will stay white, and that applies mostly to our instructions. So the instructions are now white on white which is not generally what you want. So let's change them. You just select them and make them black. Up. And the same for the end of experiment thing, which you cannot even read black. OK. Oh, and the same also for a fixation dot here. Up. OK. So if you change the foreground of your experiment, it doesn't automatically change all the things in your experiment that already had a color. Which, yeah. But it does apply to new items, right? It does apply to new items. It will be used as a default for new items. But it can be a bit painful if you like have your whole experiment ready and then you say, okay, wait, you know, I want to change the foreground maybe to, to another color. <coughs> okay, and, and now if I run it, it will be nice. Up. Dog, Q, oh no, dog was an M. <laughs> All right. So now we made two working experiments in the time span of one hour and a half. Granted, we're not like super complicated experiments, but uh, still uh, quite quick, right? Well, that's it. I think we should. Uh, we're quite nicely in time. I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Like, if you have maybe, if you are there, are there questions? Do you want to have a question round? I think, yeah? Yeah, I got a question in terms of uh, correct, correct uh, response. Mm -hmm. uh, can we use another letter instead of uh, M and U? Yes, of course, of course. And also like, with the fixation. Because uh, M and U, it doesn't make sense uh, Invisible. to okay. our country. No, 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 <laughs> no, I, I, no, I meant it. Uh, yes, so it, it will, if you click on the block loop, then in the correct response thing, you can put anything, M, Q, M, Q. Like, uh, if you have keys that don't have a name in that sense, for example, the left button, it will be called left. The right button will be called right, etc. Space bar will be called space. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have, like, what we call special characters, in kind of a Western-centric way, things that are not Latin characters, um, they should also work. You should also be able to uh, to put them here in the in the in, as a correct response. Like a, I don't know, any, anything basically anything that corresponds to a character of a of, of a keyboard. Uh, response. The, where things of, to to that co any character that corresponds to a single key press. Where things get di difficult, and I don't have, I haven't found any satisfactory solution for that, is. Um, Keyboard layouts where single characters are composed of multiple keystrokes, right? And that happens quite often in, in Asian in Asian alphabet, where you kind of like you type various things, and like if you type only one letter, it will have one character. You type another letter, they will kind of combine into another character, etc. Obsessomy doesn't support that, and that's. Uh, but uh, but uh, for example, I don't think, for example, that's the case for simplified Chinese or I don't. What, what language are you talking about? Uh, Cambodian. Cambodian, that is one of those combined uh, combined character things, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that will be difficult. Yeah. 
then in, in order to question suppress uh, uh, what uh, what we're gonna we're gonna provide to participants during the experiment, computer or they can do it online or something. They, they can do it on on uh, on a tablet or a computer. So an Android tablet, not an iPhone or an iPad, but an Android tablet or or, phone <coughs> or a computer. And actually, uh, Daniel and I will will start working on implementing, trying to implement the be beginnings of an online runtime so that that it can run in a browser. But uh, I don't see that being being a realistic option for for some time. Okay. Maybe just a, can you open your uh, assistant of defining the variables once more because I have the variable. Yes. This one, the variable. Yes. Okay. So the logic is just very simple. Every level that you have here will be combined with every level that you have here, right? So if you have two. A six here, you will end up with 12 things. So why, when you close it afterwards, you just have it like combined, or you had much less. When I do it this way, then I end up having many more combinations. So it gives me all the combinations. It gives me all the combinations as well, right? Ah, so you... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Now this is, if you click on the variable wizard, it will just have the, 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 the values for of the last time that you opened up the variable wizard. So the last time I opened up the variable wizard, we were still working on the experiment with 12 <laughs> levels, remember? So it will, it will, that's why I have 2 times 6 times uh, If I wanted to recreate this one, I would say prime Wiseau accordion and only have the Shen and the Shat here. Shen and Shat. <laughs> Press OK and then I will get this thing. See? So it's like a pretty, pretty basic full factorial design uh, generator. Okay, well, unless there are any more questions, I, uh, I, I consider the meeting closed. If you have technical questions, uh, I prefer that you don't send them to me by email, because I tend to get quite a lot otherwise, but post them here on the support forum, forum.coxi.nl, and you will A, find a lot of answers to the questions that you have already, uh, but also, if you pose new questions, you will, you will get answers quite quickly. Of course, you can drop by my office as well, right? But like to, to avoid being overloaded with emails with huge experiments and stuff.